So welcome, everybody. And this is my monthly free group coaching call. I'm Susan Campbell, as I think you know. And I won't be doing any more calls for the summer, June, July, and August. I'll resume at the first Tuesday in September. I'm taking the summer off, and I have no plan. Just going to see how I am when I don't have any agenda or any structure. So I'll let you know in September how that goes. So today, I wanted to ping off of the blog that I wrote about restoring your own flow. I wanted to start with the idea of what a healthy system or a healthy organism is able to do, how a healthy organism moves through the world. So that means you, let's say to, to the extent that you're in your natural flow, this is what it looks like. However, before I go into that, I just wanna say, there are a lot of things that happen to us early in life and later in life as well, that have us unable to follow this natural rhythm of what a healthy organism does. There's conformity pressure from the family. You have to cut off some of your own feelings and self-expression in order to belong to the family or in order to belong to the society. And there are many, many other things. And we're going to get into the other things that interrupt your flow after I just go through this model. And, and, and this, this comes from biology, but it also comes from just me witnessing my own um, clients and, and my, own, my own being as, as I've lived so many years. So an organism starts out in equilibrium. Has anybody ever felt equilibrium? Rest, relaxation. I'm, I'm just here. I'm satisfied. And I'm like, a need will arise. A need will eventually arise. Like, okay, right now I'm pretty relaxed. I'm not hungry or cold or anything like that. Just, just notice yourself and the idea that some people can't ever experience equilibrium. There are things that happened in their background. And as I said, I'll, I'll inventory those with you later on that has them always vigilant, always on alert and not, re not really trusting that when something, when I need to pay attention to something, I'll be able to do that. No, I've got to be vigilant all the time. So if, if that's true of you at all, just notice, notice how you feel with that. And it's not just the ability to be in the moment in like rest or relaxation. There's also this equilibrium concept also applies to being in balance between like in a normal human in this day and age, between sitting down and doing work and getting up and moving around and giving your body the movement it needs, staying in balance around those things, staying in balance around, uh, am I too full? Am I hungry? You know, having just the right amount of sustenance so you're not feeling hungry or, or over full. I mean, just simple things like that. The ability to sense when you're out of balance. So the, the e equilibrium, is like an organism's natural state and the ability to sense when you're out of equilibrium, like when balance is needed, when you need to rebalance things. So, so here I am, I was resting, I was in equilibrium, but now a need arises. I feel the, the urge to talk to somebody and have them listen to me. Let's say that that's what comes up. So I scan the environment then. So, so, so wait a minute, let me just pause. I feel the need. That's the second thing that happens after equilibrium is I feel some natural need. I need food or I need exercise or I need to talk to somebody. I need contact. I need a hug. So something will come up and you'll be able to feel that. And then you'll look for an appropriate object. Okay, I know where the refrigerator is or I, I know where my partner is so I can... I can go and that's a, an object 
of gratification. So I, then the next thing, you know, after feeling the need is being able to act on the need. So I can actually take actions on the need. I can ask for what I want, or I can get the right amount of food from the fridge. And then I feel whether I'm satisfied or not. So that's another step in this natural flow. Am I satisfied? I was in equilibrium. I had a need. I acted on the need. I got something. Was that satisfying? Okay, so I can feel whether I'm really ready to go back into equilibrium or not. But some of us are not able to, to ever feel satisfied. So that's another little marker for whether you're in your flow or not. And so two pieces of, of acting on the environment is expressing the need, but also being able to receive something. Now with biological needs like food, well, I guess some people can't ever feel nourished. So I guess there could be an interruption there. But with social needs, it can be a little more complicated because I had in mind a particular type of listening from my partner, but my partner is giving me 50% of his attention. And my what I had in mind was, you know, more like 90 or 100%. Okay, so expectations not being met. I know that. I, I feel that. Okay, so what do I do then? If I'm, if I'm satisfied, I go back to equilibrium. If I'm not satisfied, I take another action. I either ask my partner for something else more clearly. I ask for what I want, or maybe I look elsewhere, or maybe I just feel the tension of not getting what I want, but I'm I'm able to be with that tension in a way that's not disruptive. I could just hold that for a while, comfort myself, give something to myself. And so then maybe I'll go back to feeling satisfied. So th these are the th these are the steps in a normal organism being in flow. It's, it's it it, it kind of makes sense. So just as I was speaking about those things, were there any things that came up for you? I'm not going to ask you for comments right yet, but I will in a few minutes here. But oh, I do want to ask you to reflect on, were there any things that came up for you where you felt like, hmm, you know, that natural organismic flow gets interrupted at the expression place? I can't, I I. I can feel a need, but I can't express, or it gets interrupted. I can't even feel what I need, or I don't even trust it, that sort of thing. Or does it, does it get interrupted going back and feeling satisfied? You know, till you take an action, particularly in a social need, like attention from my partner, and I still somehow never quite feel satisfied. And I can't pinpoint what that's about. A lot of these things, you just have this vague, when I, I'm imagining at least, when I went through all these different steps, you just have this vague sense that, no, it doesn't work for me like that. It's just not that simple for me. And, and that's the way it is for most humans. I think that would be the response I would expect from from people hearing this. So I want to uh, let's I want to look at now what are some of the ways that this did get interfered with in each of our own lives, that the ability to just be in flow. Because that's what that's what flow feels like. And you just trust life when you're in flow. You know that what you know, when you when you have a need you'll know what to do. And it doesn't always mean you'll get the need met, but you'll be able to handle that tension. Freud called it binding tension. And he said that was a one mark of a mature adult. The, the ability to not always get your needs met, but you can sit with that in a way that is with yourself. And, and we're gonna talk about how to do that and how to learn that in a, a little bit later here. So how does that 
natural sequence get interrupted? Okay, so here we go with the basic childhood needs. So here's where I want you to reflect on your own life. I'm going to be going through a few of the basic developmental needs of all humans. All children need these things, these conditions to grow up healthy, to have strong bonds of attachment, to be able to feel secure in relationships and, and just relaxed about life, trust life. Again, I'm expecting that most of us had some disruptions here. So ask yourself this, this question. First, I'll, I'll say it as a statement. All children need protection from physical and emotional harm. Children need physical and emotional safety. Now we need these things all our lives, but when we don't get them later on, they're not life-threatening. So <clears throat> we can you know, the, we we ought to have uh, we ought to have developed options you know, once we're adults and on our own and not under our parents' care anymore. But what we learn in childhood is like a program. It's like a set of we a set of ex. It, it develops into a set of expectations, the childhood programming for what I can expect of the world, what's safe for me to do in the world, and how, how the world is kind of predisposed toward me. Is the universe friendly? So we, we learn this in our parents' home, generally, or wherever our early childhood is. So were you protected? from physical and emotional harm? Do you feel like your parents stood up for you? Did anyone violate you in any way? Like maybe a different, a, a different age sibling, an older sibling, sometimes it's hard for a parent to totally protect you from a, an older aggressive sibling, that sort of thing. Bullying. Would your parents step in if you were being bullied? Would they even know about it? Would you even tell them? Or was there so much chaos in the house that you felt unprotected and there wouldn't be anybody you could uh, turn to? Or do you have memories of actually being protected? Like my, I remember once there was a bad car accident that uh, my father and I came upon when we were just taking a walk in the neighborhood. And I was maybe four years old and, and he just, he just picked me up and walked away from it because I guess it was a very horrible thing to look at. Um, and I had that feeling he's protecting me from something actually, though, I wanted to see it, but you know, good for him. He was, he was protecting me. So maybe you have specific memories of being unprotected or protected or maybe you just have this vague sense of, uh, no, given the way I seem to be wired today, I'm pretty sure that uh, somewhere there I, I didn't feel safe. And I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask for a, a show of hands about some of these things at the end, but I wanna explain them each first. There's just a, a few of these basic needs. The other <clears throat> important need, one of the other ones is we all need loving attention. We need somebody who looks in our eyes and lets us know that we're valued. You're such a good kid, that sort of thing. Or I'm really, I'm, I'm really happy to spend time with you. Loving attention actually is often measured in the amount of time your parent was spending with you. Were they interested in you or did you just have to sort of tag along with the stuff that they did? What do you remember about receiving loving attention, appreciation, compliments, that kind of thing, or possibly mirroring of what you're good at? You know, you, you I, I, I know you don't like math and science, but boy, you're, you're really good at putting things together. That ability to see how all these parts fit together in these little toys or how to put that car back together. You know, you, you 
you get mirroring from the adults around you. That's important for, for feeling like I'm valued. You don't get loving attention. You're going to probably have some questions about your own value and be still seeking that later on. All of this stuff then creates unfinished business, as we know. And just a couple other um, basic childhood needs. One is we all need co-regulation. When you're upset or afraid, who do you run to when you're a child? Who Did you run to one of your parents expecting them to hold you and soothe you? You know, your nervous system is scared and agitated, but co-regulation means you put yourself near a big person who is calm or has an enough calming effect on you just from holding you and letting you know you're safe and it's okay. So how we learn to self-regulate, how we learn to tell ourselves that, hey, this is safe, you, you, oh, even though I'm upset, there's no like mortal danger here. How we learn that is from that experience of having somebody else having a like body to body regulation, somebody who we could actually feel, oh, I'm calming down because their arms are around me. They're I'm sitting on their big lap and their big arms are around me. Now, some of us are probably getting sad or angry hearing that image because we didn't have that. So notice notice what feelings are come up coming up. Um, in the blog that I wrote for the newsletter this month, the theme was in order to move at all or heal or grow from where you are, you need to start by being where you are. I mean, in order to move and grow to where you'd like to be, this is what I really wanted to say. You have to start by being right where you are, which is, I've got these deficits. I have this unfinished business. I still have this drive to get a lot of attention because I got none as a child or some, some, some other indication that your past is influencing your present. That is true of all of us. We all have unfinished business from the past. None of us got all these needs met. And some of us are willing to admit it and bring some, we're going to go into how to bring some loving attention to the fact that these things weren't ideal, that our natural flow was interrupted way long time ago, and we never learned how to re regulate it or get it back. Now, the last childhood need that I want to mention is the need for guidance and encouragement. Did anybody show you how to swim or throw a ball or tie your shoe? Probably somebody did. Were they patient? Were they encouraging? Or did they say, oh, get out of the way, let me do it, that sort of thing? Were they giving you that impression that you, you had to do it pretty much perfectly or they was they were going to take over and control the situation. So notice if you feel anxious while I'm talking, uncomfortable, or when's she going to finish? <laughs> that could be for many reasons, of course. So those are the the basic childhood needs that I wanted to mention. And when <clears throat> some of those are not met whatever that whichever one or two or three weren't met you've already got now a kind of a fear story or I'll call it a program but it's some kind of filter that you see the world through it's a story about how life is or how i am or how i'm going to i'm going to be uh, treated or seen by other people, that sort of thing. So I'm going to go back and just uh, ask for any people to just show show of hands real briefly. How many people feel like you you got an adequate amount of protection 
it doesn't have to have to be perfect, but you had an adequate amount. So let's just show hands. And then those who don't raise your hand, um, I won't ask you to, but let's just notice. Okay. And notice how you feel with that. And how many people feel like you got an adequate amount of loving attention? of mirroring and feeling appreciated as a kid. How many people feel that? Okay. And what about co-regulation? Somebody to go to and help you calm yourself down. How many people have that, had that? And maybe you don't remember much but you have a general sense that you, you had an adequate amount of that. Okay. And finally, how many people feel like you had an adequate amount of guidance or encouragement? You know, the parents weren't too perfectionistic or impatient. You had an adequate amount of that or, or even better than adequate. Some of us got really good guidance, but we didn't get some of the other things. And I see that I'm one of the few people that had guidance. I, I, maybe it's not so, maybe it's not so common to have an adequate amount of guidance. Yeah. So given that we're, we're now owning, especially when you didn't raise your hand and I didn't raise my hand for one, cause I just don't remember and when I don't remember, for me, and I, I'm I'm thinking, yeah, maybe, maybe I really had to regulate myself because I I actually sucked my thumb for a while as a child, and that's that's a form of self regulate self regulation at an early age when a a kid probably ought to be held instead of you know the parent probably ought to have picked me up and given me physical nurturance when they saw me sucking my thumb. But no, they what they do is they they take the thumb out of the out of the mouth. No. Well-meaning parents, because they care what other people think. So sure, some of us had stuff like that go on and and maybe more painful than that even. But let's admit it to ourselves now. And what what happens then? You know, once we've got this childhood unfinished business and we've got this kind of fear story about how the world is, it develops into personality patterns, like a people-pleasing pattern or um, always, always finding fault with something, always seeing what's missing, or just a pattern of being kind of suspicious um, what of what's coming in? I don't know what to trust. So these are, I call these control patterns, and I've got an extensive list of these control patterns in the book Five Minute Relationship Repair. But they're 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 things like that, or over explaining, defending yourself, that sort of thing. So we we all have these personality patterns that indicate that there's something we don't want to feel. Well, defending yourself. Somebody disagrees with you and you go, oh, well, you don't understand. Let me tell you what. Instead of feeling your feelings, that's what control patterns are designed to do is keep you within a narrow comfort zone so you don't have to revisit the fact that you have these unmet childhood needs. But of course, those of us who come to these events with me, you, you want to feel your feelings, but there are patterns that sometimes make our feelings hard to feel. And when we notice ourselves in one of these patterns, like I talked about the pattern of judging others in the blog that I wrote, oh, judging others instead of feeling your feelings, judge the other person for taking up too much space in a group. Oh, well, what's your feeling? Well, well, you start with anger, but then underneath that, it's gee, I I want I want to be able to get that kind of attention. 
there's this unmet need and there's a, a feeling of of lack of need and we don't learn that well how to regulate ourselves i mean as children i a lot of us didn't anyway learn that well how to regulate ourselves when we're feeling upset or some kind of emotional pain. So we develop all these personality patterns and these control patterns are basically what our whole personality is made up of. A bunch of strategies, we could call them coping strategies, but they're also strategies for not feeling. So when you catch yourself in one of these, and that's that's one of the very important exercises in the book, Getting Real, is revising. Revising when you notice yourself in an automatic pattern, like at the end of the day, one of the activities that I recommend is at the you know, end of each day. When was I? Hi. Hi. When was I on automatic? Uh, when did I not speak up for myself? Uh, when did I kind of shut down? Okay, so I noticed that I said something that I didn't mean or I didn't speak up at the end of the day. So what would I have said if I had been more authentic? And you actually say that out loud to yourself or as if you're saying it to the other person. So that's that's one of those exercises, one of those practices that um, I think is so, so important. Um. But the uh, the other practice, and oh, I'll slow down. Let me. Other practice is inner work, trigger work, and that's that's what I want to get to now. Is you can do trigger work without even having a specific trigger. I've taught a lot of a lot of you on this in this space already about how to start with a triggering event and inquire and feel and inquire and look and open up. And I'm going to do that with the group today, but you can do it. What I want to what I want to uh, show you is you don't have to have an explicit triggering event in order to do inner work. You can do it with some vague sense of ill at easeness, stuckness, like we've gotten in touch with here today on this call. Now, Suzanne, um, you have a comment or a question? I see that hand is raised, and I don't know if that was from before or not. I I guess not. <laughs> that was an accident. I don't know. How yeah, I... yeah, yeah. Fine. I'm sorry. Yeah. I know that happens, and sometimes when people raise their physical hand, I think the Zoom hand just pops up sometimes. So uh, I'm still I'm still learning about some of those. Thank Bell you. I'm sorry. I'll try and. Okay, yeah, get rid of that. Okay, so we're going to, in, in a few minutes, do some trigger work here today, but it's not going to be about a trigger, although a trigger reaction may come up in the process. We'll we'll see. It's going to be an experiment. Um, but just to, just to complete the kind of overview, so we have this program, our, you know, our, our program in our psyche now of what the world, what to watch out for in the world, what to look for in the world, whether it's safe to feel certain things. So we develop these control patterns and the control patterns are basically designed to ward off the feeling of being triggered. So you're trying to manage your environment so nothing uncomfortable will happen. Now, control patterns can be the reactive behaviors that indicate you're triggered as well. So that can be a little confusing if, if people are real linear thinkers, but the, the basic idea is control patterns. They, they either work to um, kind of keep your pain level down and keep you within that comfort zone that keeps you rigid and keeps you out of your own flow keeps you not feeling. So of course, triggers have the, I mean, uh, control patterns have their purpose. If you just want to stay in, I'm going to call it like a pseudo equilibrium, you know, within your comfort zone, but you're, but you're defended. 
and you're rigid because you're not going to be able to handle a lot of actual reality. The purpose of all of this, all this work is to be able to restore that flow and restore that responsiveness, that natural responsiveness to whatever shows up in your life. I call it surfing life. Something new shows up, you you have to act on it. It's something you've you've never experienced before. Just like a surfer never experienced that particular type of wave before, or that particular wave at least. So um social relations are like that. Flirting is like that. Getting to know a new person is like that. There's always kind of a dance between my behavior and then what happens in the environment. Well, gee, it was something I hadn't expected. I got a disappointing response. What do I do? Do I go into my little hidey hole? Or do I say, geez, uh, when, you, when you said that, I was hoping you'd say this. Uh, any chance I could get this instead of that? <laughs> or whatever, you know, you're spontaneous. That's, that's what a spontaneity looks like. You don't um, get controlled and limited by what the environment gives you. You have a creative response. So that's the that's the ideal healthy organism. So um, we can get back there th by doing this inner work. Um, but before I go into guiding you in how to do inner work, how to do the compassionate self inquiry practice, which I've done with a lot of you on these calls, how to do that without being triggered. Before I do that, any comments or questions about anything at all? We've got time here. Yeah, Don. Yes, yeah, Susan, I, I just realized when we went through that exercise of did we get adequate uh, modeling? Did we get adequate regulate all those things? And I didn't hold my hand up and I'd like to go out and come back in again. Right. And reflecting on it, I realized that I must have gotten enough adequate to know when I wasn't getting it. <laughs> Uh -huh. And yeah. uh, so, and then I started thinking about that uh, I had two step grandfathers who gave me the, uh, the male role models who gave me nurturing and who were the, you know, the heroes of my life, um, more so than my, my mother and my stepfather and, and, and other relatives. Um, they were my cheerleaders. They were 100% for me. So. So I did get something very adequate, and I think back at it now, and I go, "Wow, I I, I bow to them wherever they are, floating around the universe." So yeah. that's, I just wanted to mention that. I think that's a good thing to mention. Uh, thanks, Don. I'd like to ask others: um, How many of you had somebody other than your parents or outside of your immediate nuclear family, like a grandparent or a teacher or just some somebody else, another adult, who you, I'm going to say you knew enough to seek out or you were lucky enough for them to like come rescue you. But how many people maybe had more of those nurturing uh, needs met from an adult other than a parent. Anybody else besides Don? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it could be both and, I mean, your parents and and somebody else. Okay. Some, see, and you, Don mentioned like knowing, you know, knowing that I needed it or something like that. I, you didn't really say those words, but it reminded me of that. So some kids are just more resourceful to look around and look for options if they're not getting their needs met with one, like parents. So um, I don't know what makes that, but it, it's so many factors. There's so many factors besides just your parents that affect your environment because some environments have a lot of options and then for some of us, we were very, very isolated with just me, my mommy, and my daddy. And in my early uh, early childhood before school, it was just the three of us. But I was one of the lucky ones. So um, now I'd like to 
uh, see if there's any other comments or questions before I go into the, yes, Bill. Yeah, hi, this is good, Susan. Um, I didn't feel uh, listened to as a child. Uh, and the first time I remember being truly listened to was 12 years old. I was walking home from school and there was an old lady sitting on her porch and I walked up to her porch and sat down and talked and she was actually asking me questions and listening to my comments and a little sadness comes up thinking about it because, uh, you know, listening is such a huge need. Yeah. Somebody being there and, and, and caring about you and interested and uh yeah that was so many ways just really completely missing yeah it's true for so many of us being completely listened to um imagining that most of us and i'll i'll, I'll ask for a show of hands uh that most of us didn't feel well enough listened to i mean even though you might have felt nurtured in other ways how how many of you did not feel you know, Bill found somebody, uh, and maybe you found somebody, but there was a big gap. Let's just call it that—a big deficit in feeling listened to. How many ha would raise your hand? Would own that? Yeah, yeah. Thanks. That's that's a huge number there, and that's probably representative of our world mm -hmm. wow so i spent my life developing myself to be somebody who's a good listener yeah well wonderful i mean that's i mean that could be that's taking something that happened to you and actually developing yourself mm -hmm. intentionally intentionally developing yourself now if you can't um, receive if you're always um, mm -hmm. like, like giving, listening. I mean, listening to others, which is a kind of receiving, but you're not receiving listening. Some of us will interview others and you know be really good listeners, and somehow have that core unconscious belief that nobody wants to listen to me, but I can get other people talking and I can get my attention needs met that way. Yep. So done that. And done that. Yeah. Yeah. So, but seeing these things, and if if we're doing work on ourselves, which is just being conscious about what's working and not working, and stretching our comfort zone a little bit to develop. Development takes some effort. It 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 has to, there's got to be some risk like can i do it or can't i do it i'm going to try something new and um from what i hear um this is um this is very hard for the young people these days that's i'm 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 reading a lot about the the young people who are just everything's on the computer i mean those of us who are here are, i'm going to say lucky enough to have, have some kind of life outside of the internet, right? <laughs> Where we actually get to take risks in the flesh and blood. And those those are the kind that I, I think really develop us rather than anonymous, you know, interactions. So I don't know if, I, I don't know enough young people to know if this is a general thing, but, um, but let's reach out to those young people, can we? <laughs> They need us. They like Bill's become a good listener. I I, I think somehow we need to uh, mentor our our young people as a society. But uh, I digress. So um, any other comments here before we go into? I'm going to do a group um, guided, kind of a, a guided meditation into the self compassion exercise. But I'll see if I have another one more question now Suzanne that hand is there again is that real or is that just a alrighty okay your your zoom wants you to have some attention 
That's my story. Thank, thank you for the attention, even though I have to <laughs> giving you attention. You get an attention whether you want it or not. Yeah. So, so I'm gonna um try something now, and it might take five minutes of of inner guided uh, work here, and then we'll see how it worked. We'll see see what com came up, and um well, what we have to share, or maybe I'll work a little bit more with somebody after this. So I'm going to ask you guys to make sure you're feeling comfortable physically where you're sitting. I'm assuming most of you are sitting here. And if it feels good, just allow your eyes to close. And notice the chair holding you or whatever you're sitting or lying or standing on, notice that holding you, that support. So you're beginning to notice body sensations. And notice your breath. See if you can expand your breathing just a bit in order to make more space inside yourself for deeper feelings to come up. So we always start this practice by a little bit of self-calming and awareness of our body's presence in this space and opening up a kind of imaginary, but it ought to feel kind of real, an imaginary space as if you're expanding into a bigger version of yourself. You could call it the compassionate witness or just curiosity about what's there in you. And we're going to start with just any feeling that came up while I was describing what a healthy organism is able to do and experience. Or when we talked about the children need activity where we inventoried that. So something like a memory that either like Bill or Don had or that I had, those kind of things. But we'll start with something that's uncomfortable where it's kind of stuck some anxiety maybe. There could be a, an obvious traumatic event or triggering event. And if that's what comes up for you to start with, that's good too. But I wanted to kind of show everybody that you don't have to be triggered. You can just be kind of ill at ease and anxious or hurting in some way that kind of stuck that you don't have to have some specific incident to do inner work and to bring more awareness and compassion to yourself so we're starting with any any feeling any story And as, once you get that, notice how your body feels. And notice if there are any words associated with this. Or perhaps mental images. So I'm just going to give you time to get in touch with what emerges. It's kind of like sometimes when we do inner work starts out kind of foggy, and then something gets a little clearer, might not be real clear, out of the fog. And this doesn't have to be visual. So see what emerges. And maybe we'll call that your tender part right now. Something that needs your loving attention. So you're bringing that into this 
safe space that we've created with our breath and just continue to breathe slowly and deeply and notice if anything changes or moves. Is there any pain there, any painful feelings? And we're not trying to do anything or change anything, but possibly a, an insight or a thought or a memory will now emerge. Sometimes things change or you keep getting new versions of what this uncomfortable thing was that you started out with. Or it could, could just be some kind of a shape or a color. It doesn't have to be like recognizable for its emotional content. But we're going to still call this our, our tender place. And as you continue to breathe and stay with the image of this and the feeling of this, just imagine that you're a big nurturing presence, making space for this much loved part of yourself, like a much loved child. And you're listening to that child or you're listening to that tender part, even if it doesn't have words, you're just being with. And this whole idea of being with might be unfamiliar to some of us. But by my suggesting it, maybe you get just a little bit of a hint that you're like there for yourself, that you're not alone in this. That you do have a wise nurturing presence that's just part of your humanness but sometimes we need to call it in intentionally. Now continue just tracking your feelings and sensations as you hold space, as you be with. Possibly a memory will emerge. If so, just allow that. Or maybe you're just sitting quietly here with this kind of vague sense of, of this tender part. Whatever's happening is okay. We're not going for any big insight or catharsis here. Some people have the impulse to put your hand somewhere on your body as an act of nurturance. So if, if there's that impulse, go ahead and do that. Or hugging yourself. If feelings ever get intense and you wanna back off from this, you can just open your eyes and look around maybe shake your body a little bit so you can intentionally come out of the space that you've created now. And if you ever feel ready to go back into the space afterwards, after a thing like that, you can just voluntarily see where you go when you close your eyes and feel yourself again. So we'll just sit here for maybe another 30 seconds or so, getting ready to bring this to a close. Words may come, um, but they're not necessary at all. Words may come that either someone, you wanna hear from someone else or things that you wanna say to yourself. But if words come at this point, Make them be nurturing and supportive, things like I'm, I'm here with you, I'm here for you. 
I'm with you. You're not alone. So continue to track your breathing and feel your body sensations. And perhaps do something now that anchors in this feeling of being with yourself, no matter where it led to, whether it's just a, a hand on your heart or your belly or on your forehead or a hug, or just the simple feeling of your body being held by the chair or a certain kind of breathing. Any of this can serve as a kind of reminder or we call them anchors for this space that's always available to you. So with a few more breaths now, just appreciate yourself for going into this, for feeling whatever you felt. And then when you're ready, open your eyes and we'll come back to this group. So I'm going to invite a few of you to just l let me know, particularly if anybody's already experienced the compassionate self-inquiry practice with a trigger reaction. I'd like to know, um, did you do it with something other than a trigger reaction and how did that go? Uh, and then I'm going to ask for also people, did you get into a a, a a kind of a triggering memory, a painful memory that you went ahead and processed with this activity. Uh, those are some of the kind of things I'm curious about or anything else really. So how, how did that go for you is the basic question. Let me ask, did how many people went to some triggering event, some specific memory, whether it's adulthood or childhood. I'm going to just show hands for that. Yeah, because I, I haven't actually done this very much in, in a group like this. I do this with my individual coaching practice, but so I'm, I'm interested. So about half of us went to a, a, a triggering event and then worked it from there. How many people had difficulty feeling uh, compassion or tenderness for this part? Anybody have difficulty there? Uh-huh, some possible, little, yeah. I mean, usually there's some people who have, who just can't find that space. And um, my suggestion there is, um, if you really had difficulty and if you have something more like, I don't know, contempt or that's the part of me that I don't like because it wrecks all my relationships. And that's fairly common uh, sentiment when you're kind of beginning to do inner work. Um, I ask people, so if you notice that, that um, voice that's quite self-critical about um, having this thing, whatever it was, just notice how you feel about being self-critical. Just any any thing at all, if you can tap into the feelings, you're moving some energy. And that's what creates healing. It's it's staying stuck in our mind stories and I know what this means and I know what I'm supposed to do here. Um, all, all these rigid programs are what we're trying to free ourselves from. And we really can, by feeling feelings, following the feelings wherever they lead us, it can lead us to not being afraid of moving the energy. You know, if you're stuck, well, you feel like I'm safe, you know, nothing's going to hurt me. You know, I'm kind of rigid. I'm, I'm never going to admit weakness or I'm never, um, never going to sh show feelings because that'll give them the upper hand. No, those, those kind of worldviews, I'm... 
um, imagining that there aren't too many of us here who, who hold those rigidly, but we may have vestiges of all of that stuff. Uh, now we now we know enough to question our rigid patterns, but we're still some sometimes at the mercy of them. And it's important to admit it and feel sad or grieve or whatever feelings are there, anger, any any feeling moves the energy and it moves you toward healing and health and more options. Any other comments here, shares? Yeah, I uh, felt uh, I had tears in that process. Just, just I think being present to how devoid my childhood was of nurturing and caring and safety. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Tears are one of the most reliable ways for moving energy. Mm -hmm. Oh. Tears are our our allies. Is there anybody here who can't cry? You know, that would be one of those things to inquire on. I don't even have to, you know, hear from you specifically, but you know, if if you can't cry or can only cry at movies, but not in your interactions or when you're with yourself. That would be something I would suggest, you know, starting with that, you know, geez, I've just got this conundrum here, this thing I don't understand, I can't cry. And just hold that as you breathe and feel and hold space. This this practice that I'm that I just demonstrated can can be used in a lot of different ways. It's kind of what happens in meditation a lot of times, just naturally for people at least during a particular phase of meditation. I think it's probably what happens in uh, psychedelic therapy. I mean, I have I myself have had a lot of psychedelics, but I don't tend to go into childhood stuff uh, in my psychedelic experiences. But I think psychedelics can speed up the process sometimes, getting the energy moving about your actual childhood, and that sort of thing. So the aim of all of this, and then we'll we'll say goodbye for today, is to free yourself of any rigid patterns that have developed. And we won't we'll die. We'll we'll die with some of them. Believe me, we'll die with some of our control patterns intact. I always joke with my classes, you know, you'll die with unfinished business. On the other hand, we can clear up a lot of that unfinished business and become much, much closer to that natural organism, that flow, that surfer of life. We can become much, much closer to that as we as we evolve and grow ourselves. So uh, let's just keep that in mind. Uh, the idea is not to, oh, you know, I'm this conditioned way and I need to just own that and be that. Um, once you own that and be that, that's the that's the beginning of releasing it, of trying some new things intentionally. And doing that inner practice is actually one of those new things that I encourage everybody to try. Okay, I'm going to end with that. And um, thank you so much for coming. And I won't be sending out a newsletter until uh, probably the end of August also. But I will be um, starting a new honesty salon in September, and I'll be starting a new Getting Real webinar in September. So um, one's September nineteenth, and the other the 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 webinar six session webinar uh, on the truth skills and the trigger trigger work stuff that I teach. That'll start the nineteenth, and the new honesty salon will start the eighteenth. Both of them are starting at noon Pacific time. So um, if you already know you're interested in one of those, uh, just go ahead and email me. My email contact stuff is at susancampbell.com. All right. Have a good summer. I'll see you in September. And some Thank of you, you. Thank some you. Live locally. So Dusty, I'll see you at the dances. <laughs> 
can't see anybody else who lives locally. Thank you, Susan. See you this weekend. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.